Due to Spain and Morocco's geographic proximity, war was inevitable between the two countries at some point in their histories. One of the most brutal conflicts between the nations would take place in the 1920s, known as the Rif War. One of the most pivotal battles of the war would take place at Anwal in northern Morocco, marking a humiliating spot in Spanish military history in which a large Spanish force was destroyed by a much smaller Moroccan one. The conflict stemmed from Europe's scramble for Africa of the late 1800s and early 1900s. The purpose of Spain's war in the Rif was to subjugate its Moorish population. In 1912, Spain and France signed an agreement and divided Morocco's territory between them. France retained the majority of Moroccan land, and Spain acquired a region of roughly 20,000 square kilometers along the Mediterranean. While the French had a relatively easier time pacifying Morocco and building infrastructure, Spain struggled, mainly due to the mountainous terrain of northern Morocco, in which conducting military campaigns and building infrastructure was incredibly difficult. The Rif Mountains were very unforgiving and did not have large roads through them, ensuring that any military occupation would be a logistical nightmare. The conquest of the Rif was Spain's last attempt at empire. Colonies, along with attracting interest due to economic benefits, were a symbol of great prestige to Europeans, and Spain was desperate to revive its international image after the disastrous Napoleonic Wars and Spanish-American War, which had stripped Spain of nearly all of its colonies. In addition, the Spanish flu outbreak of 1918 through 1920 crippled the Spanish economy, and the government was looking for a foreign conflict to distract the disgruntled population with. Spain also controlled two enclaves on the northern coast of Morocco, dating back to medieval times, namely Mejia and Seyueta, and Spain wanted to connect them. They also speculated that the Rift Mountains, which had not been widely researched by Europeans, contained vast mineral deposits. Spain's campaign to pacify the Rift began in 1921. In the spring, Spanish forces under the command of Manuel Silvestre advanced about 100 kilometers west of Mejia to a town of Anuel. Spanish politicians and commanders remained optimistic due to this initial success, and many wanted to satisfy the Spanish government. This overconfidence would lead Silvestre to make reckless decisions on the battlefield. At first glance, it is nearly impossible to understand how the battle could develop into such a massive Spanish disaster. At the beginning of the Battle of Anuel, Spain outnumbered the Riffians 25,000 to 3,000 and had machine guns, artillery, and planes, all facets of a modern European army. The Riffians, on the contrary, mostly used outdated weaponry. War is not all about the numbers, though. In fact, organizational, cultural, and morale factors all put Spain at a disadvantage. For instance, the Spanish military was incredibly corrupt at this time. High-ranking commanders received a disproportionate amount of pay, leaving the military underfunded and the soldiers unmotivated to fight for such little monetary compensation themselves. In addition, Spanish soldiers went long periods of time without proper drilling. Unlike France, Spain did not participate in World War I and therefore did not obtain the necessary experience to fight a modern war. Another thing Spain had to contend with was how boys were raised in Riffian culture. Boys were taught how to use guns and knives at a very early age. Indeed, they despised their Spanish rivals, and their upbringing prepared them for any future conflict. In diametric opposition to the Spanish, the Riffians knew the terrain well and were well used to the Moroccan climate. Spain greatly misinterpreted the dynamics of Riffian politics as well. Spain assumed that the rivalry between Riffian tribes would prevent them from working together therefore making an invasion very easy. In fact, the opposite was true. Although Moroccan tribes had warred against one another in previous years, the charismatic Mohammed Abdel Krim rallied all Riffians against the Spanish invaders with a nationalistic and religious disposition. Above all, the Riffians could not tolerate foreign occupation. 
Abdel Krim, who had studied Spanish history, language, and culture in Madrid, understood his Spanish foes and their tactics, giving him an edge in combat. On the other hand, despite Spain's close proximity and long history of diplomacy and war with Morocco, had very little knowledge of the Berber language and culture. Instead, during their military campaigns in the Rif, they often relied on local Moor translators to communicate with other locals, many of whom were often unmotivated and unreliable. The tangled logistical situation as a result of terrible desert infrastructure and improper planning left Spanish forces under-equipped and vulnerable. There were inadequate supply of fresh water, food, and ammunition, a terrible omen for the imminent disaster at Anuel. Additionally, thousands of Spanish troops were needed to garrison the occupied land and defend the supply chain going to the front at Anuel. Another portion of them were sick. Silvestri also relied on about 5,000 indigenous soldiers and supply carriers, many of whom would defect to the Riffian side once the battle began. In total, about 22,000 Spanish troops invaded Riffian territory in 1921. In the spring, Spanish forces had established a tenuous hold over the town of Anuel in northeast Morocco and the heights surrounding it. By June and early July, Riffian forces had recaptured the heights around Anuel and prepared to assault the Spanish position. Despite the dangerous position out in open terrain, the Spanish set up three vulnerable camps at Anuel. One was held by Spanish troops, and the other two by indigenous colonial troops, who were less motivated. In total, about 6,500 soldiers garrisoned the town. Despite losing high ground around the town, the defense of Anuel was neglected due to Silvestre's overconfidence. For instance, very few defensive structures or barbed wire fences were assembled. He was reluctant to go on the defensive, under the full pressure of Spanish politicians and the king to keep an offensive posture and capture more territory. The Riffians, knowing the terrain well, were well aware of their vulnerable Spanish position and decided to capture them off guard with a stunning attack. The Riffian assault began around midnight on July 22, 1921. Inexperienced and unmotivated Spanish troops quickly began to buckle, and artillery fired blindly into the night. Immediately, Silvestre finally realized the graveness of his situation. Silvestre considered a withdrawal to more defensible ground because there were no reserve troops that could relieve Anuel, and his force only had four days of supply left an inadequate amount for any prolonged siege. From midnight until late morning, Silvestre debated in his mind over whether to withdraw or not. The Spanish government had radioed him that reinforcements would be sent from Spain. While Silvestre debated his options, the other officers at Anuel knew that reinforcements could not cross the Mediterranean and reach their rural position in time. Silvestri was also concerned about his reputation and career as a general, well aware that a withdrawal would be frowned upon by his government. His indecisiveness left Anuel vulnerable for longer than necessary, and only when he learned that a 6,000 strong enemy force was approaching did he decide to fully withdraw at 10 a.m. to Ben Taeb. The evacuation plan remained a secret between Silvestri and his closest officers. The troops knew about the evacuation, but their destination and route were unknown, and this lack of a concrete plan gave the troops a sense of a lack of urgency, and their morale remained low. The troops and lower-ranking officers were unaware of just how critical the situation had become, and this resulted in a lack of coordination and proper planning when the evacuation started. In addition, essentially guaranteeing a catastrophe, Silvestre entrusted mostly inexperienced and unmotivated indigenous troops to cover the withdrawal of the main force, and he did not send patrols ahead to ensure the safety of his route. To make matters worse, the only feasible route for a retreat wound through mountains, slowing the pace of the retreat and making them vulnerable to Riffian mountain ambushes. After the retreat began at 10 a.m., Spanish engineers demolished the camp to prevent any leftover ammunition from falling into enemy hands. 
indigenous Spanish troops were sent up the mountains to protect the Spanish columns moving through the passes by eliminating any Riffian positions. Immediately, they faced tax from Riffians in the mountains. The indigenous Spanish troops, acknowledging the hopelessness of the situation, defected to the Riffian side in rebellion against Spanish occupation. Consequently, the retreat turned into a rout remarkably quickly. The last bits of organization holding the retreat column together disintegrated, and one Spanish survivor described it as a human avalanche. To lighten the load of their carts and vehicles, in hopes of a faster retreat, soldiers chaotically disposed of the very ammunition they needed to defend themselves with. It is hard to imagine, but the situation was truly every man for themselves, and the hot Moroccan summer invigorated the troops' anxiety. Soon, more Riffian fighters joined the pursuit as the Spanish desperately tried to flee the mountain passes. Ironically, the Riffian fighters shared the same lack of organization of the Spanish forces. Indeed, the Riffians excitedly pursued the Spaniards with little cohesion, inflicting heavy casualties. Locals and fighters noticed the large amount of valuables and supplies left behind by the Spanish and were quick to loot them. Stray camels and mules were also adopted by local Moroccans. Eventually, Spanish forces rendezvoused at the stronghold of Ben Taib. After a five-hour retreat, two and a half thousand Spanish troops were lost, including some officers. Even the Spanish general Silvestre was killed in battle, and it is unknown whether he killed himself due to being humiliated or if he was killed by a Riffian fighter. Rebellions were springing up in all parts of Spanish-occupied Morocco, now inspired by the Riffian victory at Anwal. The Spanish forces garrisoned in other parts of northern Morocco joined the retreat as the Riffians advanced. They marched back to their fortifications at the coastal city of Melilla. While the Spanish were retreating from Anwal, a Spanish general named Damaso Berenguer sailed to Melilla to rally a defense. He scraped together a total of 3,800 deeply unmotivated soldiers. To his horror, the supply stocks were empty, and he hurriedly requested additional supplies and reinforcements from the mainland. Two days later, on July 24th, the recently created Spanish Legion arrived in Melilla. José Millán Astre, its leader, greeted the crowds of Melilla with motivational cheers and rhetoric. Astre, Jose Sanjuro and Francisco Franco were leaders of the Spanish Legion that would later become leaders of the Spanish fascist movement, the Falang. They were fervent supporters of a Spanish colonial empire. Meanwhile, during the retreat, some Spanish commanders opted to surrender to the Riffians in hopes of preventing their soldiers' deaths in battle, often surrendering hundreds of troops at a time. To say that the Riffians treated the Spanish poorly would be an understatement. The Riffians massacred their Spanish adversaries, often in brutal, sadistic fashion. A lack of communication between Spanish outposts meant that most Spanish units were unaware of the massacres. Consequently, most surrendered, ignorant of the massacres that would follow. By the beginning of August, a week after the annual disaster, General Felipe Navarro and his 3,000 soldiers took refuge in the town of Monte Aruit after trying to recapture Anwal. They were plagued with exhaustion and despair, and their supply route was cut off by Riffian fighters. The Spanish government encouraged Baron Gur and his force at Melilla to relieve the force at Monte Aruit, but they did not want to leave Melilla vulnerable. On August 9th, after the Riffians promised to treat prisoners well, the 3,000 Spanish soldiers surrendered at Monte Aruit. In a great breach of contract, the Riffians slaughtered 2,400 Spanish soldiers and imprisoned the rest. The prisoners, including General Navarro, endured torture, hunger, and squalid living conditions for one and a half years until Madrid was forced to facilitate a humiliating ransom deal to set them free. Only 326, including Navarro, survived. Claiming victory, Riffian forces largely disorganized, and El Krim lost control of his armies. Therefore, he was unable to organize an attack on Melilla. He later stated that his biggest regret 
was not attacking the vulnerable city of Melilla when he could, as Spain later used the city as an artery to pump even more troops into Morocco. In just 18 days, thousands of Spanish troops had been killed and 5,000 square kilometers of land had been lost. The material losses were equally as disastrous. The Riffians captured 200 artillery pieces, 20,000 rifles, 400 machine guns, and plenty of ammunition and medical equipment. Spain officially reported 13,000 casualties, but other European analysts believed this to be a conservative estimate. Estimates range as high as 20,000 total casualties. Either way, Spain lost a staggering number of troops against a disproportionately smaller foe. On the other hand, the Riffians lost just 800 soldiers. After the battle, Europeans took great interest in the leader of the Riffians, Abdel Krim, and were surprised at how a man with such little military background could defeat a modern European army. As a result of the defeat, Spanish politicians and military officers organized a commission to investigate who was responsible for the disaster. A bitter rivalry ensued between the politicians and officers, and both sides blamed each other. As a result of the civil strife, General Miguel Primo de Rivera staged a coup against the democratic government, initiating a military dictatorship that would last from 1923 to 1930. At the same time, the Riffians used their captured military equipment to thwart any Spanish attempt at reclaiming Morocco, resulting in more Spanish defeats. The defeats at Anwal and beyond convinced many Spaniards that a colonial empire in Africa was simply not worth it. Still, many favored colonial expansion, especially nationalists like Franco, Astre, and Sanjuro. The political instability and division that would follow would later contribute to the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War in 1936. For roughly five years, Abdel Krim established a Riffian Republic and built up infrastructure and foreign relations. The victory was short-lived, however, as Riffian raids into French Moroccan territory would bring France into the conflict in 1925. Although seeing early successes, the might of the French war industry and a new alliance with Spain would lead to the collapse of the Republic of the Rif. Finally, Spain conquered Morocco by 1926. El Krim's status as an anti-imperialist revolutionary drew support from socialists, communists, and anti-imperialists in Europe, and later inspired independence movements in Africa and Asia. El Krim's tactics influenced future revolutionary guerrilla fighters such as Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh, and Che Guevara. Ultimately, the Battle of Anwal during the Rif War was Spain's last attempt to maintain a colonial empire. Anwal was a humiliating defeat for Spain that had long-lasting military and political effects.